Lazy Devlog 24 for July 2023. Surprise! So this is one of those videos that I record periodically for um, the coffee subscribers. But uh, this month, because it's like a two year anniversary, I decided to record this video for everybody. So you get to follow me throughout this month as I try to pull up something that is a bit crazy. Let me explain. Right, let's get to the bottom of this. So this is the month of July and um, I am about to, uh, I'm supposed to uh, record all of the episodes for the next month, the month of August in July. These are going to be eight episodes. So that's no problem usually, you, you know, I have a whole month free. But this time there's going to be a bit of a complication and that is going to be this time here, this all this time, that is time that is going to be gone because we are going to be in uh, doing a bit of a camping trip. So this leaves us with about two weeks to record, to plan, to record, to edit and to upload eight videos. That is going to be insane considering that most of the time, you know, I was finished with this work, you know, at the end of the month and not in the middle of the month. Okay, so how I'm going to produce eight videos in two weeks. The rough plan will be we're going to do the recording. Uh, we're going to do that in the first week and then we're going to do the editing here in the second week. And that's going to be a bit of a shorter week. Um, we're going to try to get the recording finished as soon as possible so we get more time editing because usually editing took a little bit more time than recording. Um, I usually, I think I can pull off recording two episodes per day. So maybe recording will going to be finished like here in this period in the first half of the first week. And I'm going to get the second um, half and the next week uh, free for editing. Um, so in order to start recording tomorrow, in order to start recording tomorrow, we're going to have to prepare everything today. And that means um, we're going to have to do two things. We're going to have to prepare and the coffee stuff, because at the end of the each video, I'm going to do a shout out to new coffee subscribers and I'm going to introduce, you know, I'm going to discuss and respond to some of the comments from the community. I'm going to have to do this today. And then also I'm going to have to create a list of all the coffee subscribers, do all this prep work. That is also going to be today. And I'm going to have to do at least plan the first two or three episodes also today. So yeah, we have a busy day ahead of us. All right, it's the next day. I have everything prepared. I sat down and made all the lists and I did also some work to today in the morning uh, to kind of figure out kind of what we're gonna work today. This is my setup here right now. So as you can see, I have my light here. It bounces off the wall. So I have a more of a diffuse light. I have this blue light, which shines the kind of like a, some blue accent light in the background. Of course, I have the Gundam on. And this is the camera I'm always talking to. Uh, this is the microphone attached to the wall, so it's not in the way. And yeah, that's the notebook that does everything. It is the second day of recording. Yesterday actually went really, really well because I was able to record four episodes. That's kind of like halfway done. So if I can record four more episodes today, um, that means we're done recording in just two days. That would be incredible. Then I have a lot of time to, or not a lot of time, but I have more time to do the editing. So let's see if we can make it work today. Again, ready to record. Here's my camera. I have a little bit of a script off to the side here that you cannot really see because this blue area is actually the area that is um, like if I record my screen, that is going to be the screen recording. I have um, my Pico 8 here and then here I have a little bit of um, another note uh, text file, uh, one that is actually part of the, of the tutorial series. And then over here is my OBS. All right, so I was able to record all eight episodes in just two days, which is incredible. That, that's, that hasn't happened before. So now the rest of the work is just like going through all the footage and editing it. Yeah, so here I'm in DaVinci Resolve. This is my timeline, this is a video. I already synchronized, you know, the footage from the camera with the footage I recorded in OBS. So this is the recording of, of, of my desktop basically. And this is the recording of my face. And then you have to synchronize them 
together. And then I'm just like playing the video and just watching it regularly. And then every time there is like some kind of break, some kind of pause or some kind of problem, then I do like an edit there. Sometimes I have to change the layout a little bit uh, when I show my actual desktop, not just like the Pico 8 screen and so forth. And yeah, this is a bit of a, a, bit of a tedious process because you know it takes a while. You have to watch this, but also you have to constantly interrupt your watching being, and do the small edits. Uh, this can take some time. And usually I, I like to do like one video per day, but I think in this case, we might want to try to go for two videos a day. Let's see if we can make this work. All right, so this is Sunday and this is what a finished edited video looks like, or almost finished edited video looks like. So I went through this entire thing. I make a lot of cuts, especially in those videos. I was a bit tired, so there was long breaks and, and thought pauses. So I'm trying to eliminate, eliminate them so the video is a bit more snappier feels a bit more snappier. And then at the end, of course, there's like, you know, your Kofi supporting stuff. And this is where all the information goes in. Sometimes I have to pull footage from different sources. All this takes time. I'm also putting music underneath. Um, also, you see those blue dots at the top, at the top here. This is where I also mark some chapter markers. Um, so later on in on YouTube, I can set up the you know the, the different chapter markers. Another thing I also do is sometimes mark. We can see it here a little bit. Yeah, here sometimes I mark segments orange, and that is for the intro, which is the thing I'm working on today. So um, uh, I eventually, when I finish editing, I collect all of the orange marked sections together at the beginning of the video, and then I listen to them, and then I write you know the introduction to each video, like the like the gag at the at the beginning of each video, and that's something that I'm going to record today for the first four videos. So I decided to go through the entire editing process on the first four videos only. Um, to edit them and to publish them, to render them out. So in case something goes wrong in the next week, I still have uh, you know half of a month of videos finished for August. So when push comes to shove, I can finish the last four videos at the beginning of August. Not something I want to do, but um, yeah, I, at least I have this, the safety of doing this. And yeah, editing today is a pain in the butt because it's like it's another hot day and it's I'm miserable. It is Monday, so I was able to release the first four videos on the weekend. I also started editing the next four videos or the last four videos. I'm actually quite far in. I'm in the middle of the second to last video. So I think, I think we can make it. All right, it is Wednesday and all of the videos have been uploaded. There is a bit of a step at the end when the videos have been rendered and when you release it on YouTube, there is like a big, Actually, quite a substantial step where you know I'm providing all of the links to the code before and after each episode, and I have a like a GitHub uh, repository that needs to be updated. I have Dropbox links that has to has to be created, and also down here I have like the um, time codes for you know the individual sections within each video, and I have to like sit down on in uh, DaVinci Resolve and like get out all of the codes and copy and paste them into the video description. I have to create thumbnails and so forth. So there's quite a bit, actually it takes like a entire day to get this done for um, for like videos for one month. So that's a big, big, big step. But now we're finished. So that means we actually achieved our goal. Yay. I have also spent uh, the evening at Cologne Game Lab. So this is one of the institutes I'm teaching at and the semester was just over, so all the students ex exhibited their, their games that they've been working on throughout the semester, so it's always really fun. There's like a grill, and we all drink beer and play each other's games. So I really enjoy those final presentations, and it was really nice to see you know, what my students came up with. Very exciting evening. All right, so we're almost on our way to the camping trip thing. Uh, my wife and my daughter actually already left the spending some time in Munich with family and so I had like like two days of, of just relaxing and be able to catch up with some stuff that got left behind in the recent weeks. Um, yesterday was more just like you know doing business stuff and, and, and you know bills and so forth but today I'm gonna actually attempt something that I've been working on for quite a while so I will be building this thing here. This is called a GBA HD. So this is a consoleizer mod for a GBA. So I've recently, on previous episodes, I removed two chips from, um, from a GBA. 
And now today the goal is going to be to solder those tiny little chips with those tiny little legs. I need to solder them onto this, this motherboard. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I need to solder together later on if that succeeds. And then hopefully I will get a console that is basically a GBA that can attach to the TV and play GBA, uh, GBA games on a TV. Uh, but this is a bit scary. Uh, yesterday I did some uh, exercising to get, you know, to develop the techniques to solder on the legs to kind of like practice a little bit. There was like a little black practice board that I did. Um, yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be crazy difficult. Let's see if I can pull it off. Let's see, and this looks pretty good. I'm kind of surprised that it went so well. I did have to, um, the upper row is slightly misaligned, but I think it's gonna be okay. Uh, I had to do one restart because I realized that the chips were both misaligned, so I had to like desolder them, which was a bit of a nightmare. I'm very nervous about these things, but it looks like it's it went well, all things considered. Let's see if we can make the rest of the thing work. All right, so this is the real deal. This is this entire thing soldered together. I haven't put it in the in the casing yet. And it works kind of like it gives me the the Game Boy logo, but sadly it doesn't proceed into loading the game. So I'm not sure what exactly the problem is. I will have to contact the people that made this thing and maybe they can give me an idea of where the problem is. But I'm honestly, I'm kind of blown away that this works already. I'm kind of blown away that, that, that this actually works. Like the um, controller actually works. Uh, you can enter the menu of the emulator thing and you can see that, yeah, it, like the animation works and everything. So I'm, I'm I have an inkling that might be a, just a little, maybe one connection loose somewhere. I will have to debug this. Now I just need to clean up this stuff and uh, pack my bags. It's six in the morning and I'm on the train station. So I'm on my way to Darmstadt, which is uh, where I'm gonna meet up with the sister of my wife. And then we're gonna continue on down south to Austria and so forth. Um, it's going to also going to be a bit of a crazy trip because um, I, there is a, like a new ticket that is available in Germany where it's like for 50 euro you get to travel every train for a month, uh, which I got. But the problem with that is you don't get to get the intercity trains, only the regional trains. So I'm totally taking advantage of that <laughs> in a way. <laughs> and um, I'm just taking regional trains to the trip. It's with an intercity train, it's a two hour trip. But with the regional trains, it's gonna be like twice that much. So that's why I'm up that early. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have stuff to read, you know, it's gonna be a long trip anyway. So <laughs> hopefully it doesn't matter. Yeah, so this is my luggage and um, I want to show you this. So I got a portable battery for the camping stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm totally planning to, to return it after after the camping, just like, because we don't really actually need it, aside from the camping, but I'm eager to see how this works. Yeah, so we arrived here in, um, we're near Salzburg, and uh, this is a, this thing here, that's a lake called the Moon Lake, Mondsee, and we've been swimming there a little bit, we've been camping for a couple of days now, just, you know, enjoying ourselves, and, um, not thinking a lot about game development right now. Hey, so this is the second week of the vacation. We are now moved to this place called Ahasi, which is a pretty, pretty amazing looking location. Uh, sadly, the last two days has been raining cats and dogs and it's been very cold. So this is kind of like the first day when it's reasonably good weather. And we're gonna stay here two more days and then it's gonna go it's gonna be going back to a civilization which I'm kind of looking forward to. There is no internet here, guys. There is no internet here. See you in Bonn. Ah, yes, yes, welcome to Bonn. Welcome once again to the Lazy Devlog number 24, the 24th 
Lazy Devlog on this channel. <sighs> Back in, in Bonn and uh, man, that was a hell of a month. Mm. So um, today what we're gonna discuss are uh, we're gonna do a coffee debrief as always. We're gonna do a YouTube debrief. We're gonna talk a little bit about the two week sprint that I just did and how it went and how it didn't go well and what I would do better next time around. We're gonna talk a little bit about a vacation, what happened there. Uh, I want to talk about the GBA HD. Uh, I want to talk about um, Pix Square and Pixel Dailies, which I did on my vacation a lot. I want to talk a little bit about the books I've read on vacation. Um, and then also I wanted to con uh, comment on on kind of like the uh, idea that video tutorials are maybe bad and like some people hating are hating video tutorials. I want to comment on that one. Uh, I want to, to uh, discuss some games I've played, which is, let's be honest, it's just Final Fantasy Adventure at this point. <laughs> I didn't have too much time to play anything else. And then finally, we're gonna discuss the plans for next month. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So let's move on to the coffee debrief. And usually, when I do these uh, these lazy devlogs, you know, usually I say something like, you know, if you're watching this, that means you're supporting me on, on coffee.com. That is not the case this time around because this is a um, lazy devlog for everybody, a public lazy devlog. Uh, but yeah, I usually do like a. A uh, big thank you to all of my supporters uh, that are supporting me on Coffee. Thank you so much for all your support, guys. Um, so development has been positive on on the on the Coffee. We got we are at 117 subscribers, so a little bit more than last time around. Just slight increase. The active subscription value has increased to 640 euro per month. Uh, that's 50 euro more than last time around. I don't know. Some people maybe in increased. Uh, their donations, which I'm very grateful for. This is really <laughs> blowing me, <laughs> blowing my mind. Uh, and then uh, overall, I received 673 euro in total for uh, for this month. So once again, thank you so much for all of your support. Now, moving on to uh, YouTube. Um, there is, has not been a lot of development on YouTube. Um, I'm just, you know, steadily publishing the videos. And I already said that on the previous episodes that, you know, you get like into the long tail of things where um, there's not like your most successful videos are already behind you and all of the next videos are always like decreasing in view but there has been a bit of an act uptick of views recently um, I'm 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 thinking it might not be related to the actual uh, tutorial videos that I'm publishing um, because one of the most successful videos well the most the successful video for this time period is still the dev term video man that that video has legs <laughs> um so i think the u console from dev term just came out it just was actually shipped to people and so maybe there is more more of an interest in the dev term uh, i'm gonna have to get in contact with clockwork clockwork pi if they want to if they want maybe send me a review unit, it would be really nice. Otherwise, you know, the videos I just released are kind of like down here. The Wall of Schmups video was quite quite uh, successful, maybe because of the thumbnail, I don't know. <laughs> and then still, like the shorts still receives some views. I'm thinking actually maybe at some point when I finish with the tutorial to maybe do like a TikTok series where I condense all of the episodes and kind of like a quick rundown of the entire process. Um, uh, might be easier also to for people to digest who have not been following the tutorial. We're gonna see about that. Right, so let's talk about how things went. Man, this was... I'm I'm amazed that everything went so well as as well as it did. Like, um, first of all, I did like the two week sprint and as you saw, I was very worried if I'm gonna make it or not. I was able to make it. Um, I'm glad that it worked. Um, there are some takeaways I, I, I took from this. First of all, um, well, if first of all, it seems like I, I can pull it off in two weeks if I focus on this a lot and, and do a lot of stress, <laughs> stressful editing, then yes, and then I can pull off eight videos in two weeks. So that's good to know that this is kind of like the limit. I think I, I couldn't, have, couldn't have done much faster. Maybe a couple of days, but who knows. Um, 
but I also noticed that um, recording eight videos in two days was not good. I noticed this while editing stuff. I was not quite um, happy with the performance, with my performance on camera uh, on those videos because they were very condensed. And, I, and you could feel that I was a bit stressed out uh, and and kind of like a bit tired. So um, yeah, I think like two to three videos is this, this is the sweet spot I feel per day. I think if I lengthen the recording by um, on onto three days, um, that would have been overall a better result. But uh, yeah, I I couldn't have known, right? I couldn't have known if I had the time to um, to edit those videos. So I was kind of like really eager to get the recording done as quickly as possible. Uh, but yeah, now I know for for the future that that you know <laughs> what my limits are. <laughs> It's kind of funny because you can tell that the editing took a lot more time than the recording. The recording was very short compared to the editing. Um, but the recording is kind of like more sensitive. Like you, you kind of have to be on your A game when you record. And when you edit, you know, you can just like slouch off and, and just like you know, do whatever you want. But when you're recording, you kind of have to be like, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's good. It's good to know. I wonder, also I wonder kind of like what the response to this video is going to be. Like uh, I deliberately this time around, I actually actually showed a little bit more of the process of the uh, creation process because I know this is this video is going to be going out to a wider audience than usual. Yeah, um, so uh, also we really went on vacation. The vacation was fun. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a big vacation guy, but um, uh, and we're kind of like still difficult to speak about now because man, now we just it just arrived, right? So I'm not exactly, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe I need some time for the emotions to settle. And there has been a lot of quarrels and and conflict because obviously we were there with my daughter and my daughter is a brat, and uh, and we were camping, which adds additional stress and so forth. Um, but yeah, as you saw, I, we were in two locations at Mondsee, the Moon Lake and Aha Z uh, from two locations. Oh man, it's they were both beautiful. I was kind of blown away. I've never been to Austria before. And it was kind of <laughs> it was kind of crazy to see how idyllic the landscape looked like. Like it's I obviously knew Austria from movies, you know, from like you know Heidi or something. Uh, but it was just mind blowing how much it resembled, you know, <laughs> how much it literally looks like in the fairy tales and so forth. It's it's kind of mind blowing. It's a crazy place um, in, in terms of, of you know, <laughs> vibes and, and landscape. Uh, beautiful mountains, beautiful lakes. The lakes is something that blew me away. I'm usually not a big swimmer. Uh, especially on lakes because lakes are you know, kind of like there's some muck and plants and they're dirty and so forth so i don't like swimming in lakes but man the lakes like the mountain lakes were just like so clear and like this blue water because of like minerals in the in the in the glaciers a very clear water you could see like down to the bottom and there's you could see the fish swimming around you uh, beautiful beaches uh, lots of swimming places everywhere, not really that crowded, even though there were a lot of tourists, but it, you always got, got a spot everywhere. And the temperature was really nice too. Uh, so yeah, I was we were blown away by this. Um, also lots of hiking, obviously, because mountains and forests and so forth. Uh, sadly, didn't do so as much hiking as we wanted because of my four-year-old daughter, who is not that much into walking around. But yeah, like incredible scenery. Um, it's kind of, I've, it's kind of difficult to pick from Monsee and Ahasi. Pick which one I liked more. I, I liked the Monsee because it was kind of like more of a um, more bathing centered place. The Monsee is a really nice place to to do bathing, and there's lots of beaches uh, or shores, I guess. No, it's not really a beach. Um, Ahasi was way more impressive in terms of landscape. There's just like mountains rising from that lake uh, and lots of like uh, canyons to traverse and everything. So that was a lot more interesting. Uh, but also in Ahase, we had like really bad, bad luck with the weather, lots of raining. And you know, and when you're doing camping in a tent and it rains and you're camping like in a forest camping place and then everything gets muddy, uh, it's just like miserable. And then you have a four-year-old who's bored <laughs> jumping around in the tent. It's there were a couple of days in there that were a bit stressful. 
Um, also, generally, I think two weeks is a bit too long. Me and my wife have figured out at some point that's like 10 days is the perfect length for, the, for our vacation. And that was a little bit too long. Uh, also, um, as I said, like we, like in terms of bathing, you could always, there was always enough space. But especially at Aharzi, you could tell that it's very much established as a tourist location. Um, and yeah, that, that didn't feel so great. It's, like, it's kind of like this, this weird paradox of traveling. You know, whenever you are a tourist, then you are go somewhere where other tourists are. And then you are upset about the other tourists, even though you are yourself are the tourist. Um, yeah, it was, uh, especially Ahazi, it felt very expensive for our budgets. Uh, we kind of have had to like go along with it. But yeah, it comes kind of weird. Um, but yeah, no, great food too. Like we, I ate some really great um, Käsespätzle and and uh, Wiener Schnitzel. So, mm, what's not to love? Also, I wanted to show you. Yeah, I I want to give you a final review of the. Oh, it's very heavy, of the anchor battery. Yeah, so this bad boy here has been uh, doing some good work on on our camping vacation. It's I think the smallest power. Um, power bank, like the, the heavy duty power bank that the anchor is doing. Um, it's, it was great. It was great having it in our tent to charge our all our devices. At, at this point, I have a lot of devices. I have the camera and, and everything and, you know, gaming devices and uh, Kindles and uh, cell phones, obviously, iPads. So um, ch charging everything with, the, with this bad boy was cool. Um, we had electricity in one of our camping locations, uh, we're both actually, um, but in one of them, uh, we decided not to use it every day. And then that was, we could save a little bit of money. And so we could um, work off this um, all the time and periodically would charge in the, in the car um, or um, on the, in the plug. Uh, it was good, mm, broadly speaking. There's one thing I don't like about it. And that's why I don't feel so bad if I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally, I'm gonna totally return this. If you are from Anchor, you have to close your ears right now. Don't listen to this. Um, so one thing I don't like about this is how you charge the thing. So there's just a single, a single uh, barrel plug that charges the whole thing, and it's it's not like integrated to the device, but you have to bring with you like this thing, right? It's like the charger, and that's just like, come on, guys. It's already such a huge box, right? Like, why don't you just integrate it into the box, right? Just have a, ooh, <laughs> it has a light. Um, it should have like a, just an AC plug integrated into it. Like maybe like a flap opens up and you just get a wire and plug it to the wall. I don't know, it's, it's, it just feel like, it feels like such, a, such an oversight. But yeah, um, vacation's over. Now back to the regular. A very regular program. In fact, one of the things I want to return to is, so you saw me soldering this bad boy. So this is the uh, GBA HD. This is a project that's been going on for a couple of months now, um, weeks, let's say weeks. I managed to solder on the two, um, the two chips. I took off the Game Boy Advance and soldered it on there. It works as you saw, but it doesn't load the game. I contacted the people who made this. Um, they gave me some tips. But already I have an idea what, what the problem might be. I think I didn't use enough solder on the legs and some of the legs actually don't connect to the main board. And uh, it just so happens to be that the legs that don't connect are the ones that are um, connecting to the cartridge. Um, I checked some continuity on some of the legs, which is kind of difficult because you have to like use your multimeter on like tiny little wires. And yeah, some of the legs are not pr properly soldered. I just have to like rework some of the sides. Um, maybe I will do like a continuity check with all of the little legs, just to make sure that I know which sides I need, need need work, and then rework that side. And then I I I have a hope that it will work. If it doesn't work, I'm gonna desolder the entire chip and just order a new chip and just keep doing it until it works eventually. But yeah, that whole project was. Pretty intense. Never did a soldering of this magnitude, of this complexity. Um, even after soldering this, the chips, there was like lots of little other junk that needed to be soldered on. That was easier to do, but still just a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, you're gonna have to tune in on the next Lazy Dev Look to see how the GBA HD 
uh, situation played out. I'm hoping to actually sit down this evening and and uh, do some more work on it. I'm kind of like I was kind of itching the entire time in, in vacation. I was itching to get back to it because I feel like it's it, it, I can make it work. It, I was already blown away that you could like the controller worked and you could like go in the menu. That was just like yes. Anyway, so one of the things I also did on vacation is I want to talk about is um, so. <laughs> I had this. I always have, have this crazy plan whenever I go on vacation uh, or take a break. I have um, always this plan that I'm gonna do lots of work done, <laughs> and it never works out. Uh, so I took my iPad with me. I hope I'm gonna do some pixel art for the shmup because there's actually a lot of pixel art that needs to be done, and um, I didn't do any, oh, very little pixel art for the shmup. Uh, but I got a little bit into pixel art. So um, as in the previous weeks I've been discussing, or previous months, uh, I've been discussing that I'm still looking kind of like shopping for the right pixel art app for the iPad. I've been working with Procreate. I've been working with Pixie, Pix, Pixiaki was the other one app I tried. Well, both are have advantages and disadvantages. Pixiaki was the one that I settled. Uh, for for a while, but also now this Pix Square just came out, and this looked interesting. Um, Pixiaki is the one I used previously was a little bit similar to in, in terms of UI and how it works, it was a bit similar to Procreate, but like specified for like specifically designed for pixel art. Um, Pix Square uh, seems to be vibing off uh, Asprite, and I've been using it for a month now, uh, and it was. It's hard to decide. I, I kind of like I'm a bit biased towards Pix Square, and maybe that's because it looks a little bit like uh, like Asprite, so I associate it with pixel art more than Pixiaki. Um, and also, it feels like it's more active in development right now. There's like constantly updates coming out and you know new developments. Um, something I did not like with P um, Pix Square is the animation tools. They supposed to work like Asprite, but I felt like it was what the all the buttons were widely unintuitive. Um, there's like those icons, and I don't understand what the icons do. I constantly wanted to try to do something, it didn't work. And even I, if I figure out what to do, it felt like there's lots of steps involved to do like a very simple animation. Um, uh, some tools like the um, the how we call it the symmetry tools were a lot simpler than in other apps, so that I like that. Um, still on the edge. Um, oh yeah, and also I felt palette manipulation was easier because you could load in things directly from um, from low spec, so that was nice. Uh, and another thing I also did, like the, and that's also kind of like a cool thing I would suggest if you want to get into pixel art, if you want to start practicing pixel art, because there's always like this problem. People are asking me, you know, how 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 do I do pixel art? You know, can you do a pixel art tutorial? And the problem is that um, when you're in position when you need pixel art right now, what you should have done is started like months ago, <laughs> practicing your art. So now you could deliver it. There is nothing specific that you can learn like right now that will improve your pixel art somehow, like massively. It's something that gradually improves over time with all of the art. It's like this. With programming, it's not it's not quite the same thing. Like programming, there are certain things that you need to know in order to progress. Like you don't know how to do mm, and then I do a tutorial and then you know how to do mm. Um, not so much with, 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 uh, with art. So a good thing with art is just to practice it, just continue making it regularly. And uh, one good opportunity to do this is the pixel dailies hashtag. So this is Mastodon. I, for very obvious reasons, I have abandoned Twitter. I'm slowly closing out my. I'm not closing the accounts, but I'm not going to use them as often on Twitter or X or whatever it's called right now. Uh, definitely moved on to Mastodon um, and only have one account in Mastodon. Um, and so yeah, I uh, joined this hashtag called Pixel Dailies. There's a Discord server, and every day they give you a new prompt, and then you're supposed to make pixel art based on that prompt. Uh, so every day you do a little pixel art um, graphic. And I started it very simple. I started with 16 times 16 as a sprite size and just two colors, so one bit color. And yeah, I did it for the month now and you always using the uh, Pix uh, Square app. 
And yeah, it was really fun. It was really fun to do that. It's uh, it's kind of a good thing too, because like getting into habit is difficult. But when it's that easy, when it's just like one bit in incredibly small size, then you always feel like it's it's over so quickly that um, you maybe overcome like this inertia. Um, so yeah, I did that for a month. And you know, at the end of the month, you have 30 little illustrations, uh, pixel art illustrations. That's already really cool. And some of them may be also useful for games. At least you get a little bit of practice. And it's also fun to work with the prompts. Like for example, this was burned. So I made a CD ROM. <laughs> uh, or a musician, this is the uh, saxophone playing walrus. Maybe the walrus is not quite recognizable, but I think the saxophone reads well. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, this one is the one, the reason why this is Mantis. And I think a lot of people are doing a praying Mantis, but I did Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy. So that was fun as well. Uh, yeah, the person who got me into it, I think was Jemigans. And uh, yeah, he did a lot of these things. He also did like, um, always does at the end of the month, like summary of all of the graphics, uh, all of the little sprites from the month. And I'm going to do that as well, but I didn't have the time to compile it just yet. But yeah, like he makes amazing stuff using a Pico 8 color palette too. Nice. Yeah, so I would recommend you to join Pixel Dailies if you want to. You can do it on Mastodon, you can do it on Twitter or wherever you want. It's kind of like, you know, just a community of people working on the same uh, pixel art prompts. Speaking of which, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some books I've read. So I've had some time and in the tent <laughs> each evening. So I, I kind of like churned through my um, uh, my backlog of books that I, I wanted to finish. Uh, I picked this one just recently. Um, uh, somebody on Twitter, I think, uh, posted some quote from that book. And I thought, oh, that was actually interesting. That was I, I actually wanted to know more about this. This is called Art and Fear, Observations of the Perils. Uh, observations on the perils and rewards of art making by David Bailey's and Ted Orland. A uh, very short book, just like 100 pages or so. Um, I liked it. It's a book about, it's like, you know, like, a, it's not a fictional book. It's like, a, I don't know, a practical book um, um, about making art. And, uh, you know, you can, they kind of like are very broad about what art means. So it could be photography, could be painting, could be anything. I think you could also apply this to making games. Although maybe not quite. There might be some slight differences. Um, I really loved especially the first half of the book, which focuses very much on the practice of making art and everyday struggles of making art. It does a really good job verbalizing you know, all of the challenges that are associated with making art. You know, um, how it's sometimes difficult to get started and, and how you have your doubts about, about if your art is worth anything or not. Mm, really good stuff, really good discussion and, and some good advice. Um, some good like mindset on how to approach making art. Broadly speaking, we very much focus on this idea that you have to make stuff. Like all of your troubles or of your issues are kind of like solved by making stuff. Uh, and you should focus on making sure that you keep making stuff rather than, you know, mulling over whether it's worth something or not. Just like focusing on your relationship with your work. Second half of the book is... Uh, not so good. Um, they have some weird, very American-focused um, uh, ideas of arts and the art world. And it goes into like arts, philosophy and theory. And uh, it's just like, uh, I don't know, this is, this is not great. But first half is good. Like you can reach a, read the first 50 pages and then and, and, and end it right immediately there. Uh, something that was really fun is that um, it was interesting to read the book with the mindset that, okay, well, how does this apply to make, making games and not making games? Um, something that occurred to me is that games are kind of like in this weird position where... Um, so one thing that they discussed is how art uh, needs to be accepted or not accepted by the audience, how there's the audience perceives the art and and um, might put it in like a genre to understand it or might not understand it and be challenged by the art and so forth. So there's like the, lots of things happening between the art work and the audience. And it occurred to me that um, with games, we are much more reliant on 
working with our audience. Um, like typical art can be more challenging to the audience and, and, and alienating to the audience. And with games, there, there needs to be like a base agreement between the creator, game creator and the game audience. That there's like this illusory attitude that sometimes has been discussed in theory. Like this, there's a willingness of the audience to play the game. And I feel like that's that threshold at least is not quite as big with, with regular art. Um, and so so it feels like we are naturally in games creation, we naturally tend maybe towards certain genres and certain tropes, which help the audience overcome that barrier, help them to be like, ah, this is something I'm already familiar with. I know, already know how this works. And that's what gets them into the game. And then maybe the challenges and the subversions happen later on. Yeah, cool book. I would recommend if you are struggling with making games, maybe that helps you along a little bit. Another book I read was this one. This is a short story correction collection by Greg Egan. Greg Egan um, is a science fiction author I'm fond of. Uh, this is as hard of a sci-fi as it gets. <laughs> If you thought The Expanse was hard sci-fi, boy, you have no idea, man. <laughs> this is crazy hard sci-fi in the sense that Greg Egan is like a mathematician, physicist kind of guy. Uh, he is on social media and um, he regularly posts like mathematical ideas and analysis. That's what he do, does all day, just like doing mathematical analysis of different weird mathematical constructs and all of these short stories feel like you know a short story spun out of some kind of scientific paper <laughs> they feel like novelizations of of um, scientific papers um this is a short story collection so it's a bit more palpable because you know the sh stories are uh, short I liked it a lot. Uh, it, you know, Greg Egan is a specific kind of um, taste, acquired taste. Um, all of his characters in his book are kind of like <laughs> sock puppets for, for himself. They all feel, it feels like all of the characters in his book are kind of like, I don't know, like um, neuroatypical, I would say. <laughs> it's just like very, very technically focused and very not, not like, mm, it's, it's hard to explain. Uh, not in a negative sense, but it's just like uh, he has like a very specific style and, and very specific focus. Um, but um, yeah, there are some ide ideas that he's wrestling with are interesting. And if you can follow him, I mean, he will lose you at some point because he just goes like crazy. But uh, if you can read between the lines and can hold on to the, it's going to be a wild ride through some crazy ideas. Um, I'm going to point, uh, pick out one story that I, that kind of struck me, which was Solidity, which is the last story in this in this collection. Um, it's kind of like a spin on a multiverse idea, but it does multiverse right, in my opinion. Um, something I don't like about multiverse, which is a very popular idea at this point in comic book stories, is that you typically have... Um, the multiverse is not about the multiverse. The multiverse stories are not about the multiverse. Um, they are um, a carte blanche or like a license for the authors to explore what if stories and but make them still belong to the same story. Like kind of like an excuse to to explore what if scenarios, um, which is okay. I don't mind that. I, I think it's very cool if you have like in a superhero story and then it's like what if scenario. That's very, very fine. What I don't like about the multiverse is that this attempt of making it all kind of like explain how it all fits together. I don't think you need that. I think that's superfluous. I feel like that may be pandering to like some kind of fan audience that, that feel like if they're reading a standalone story that doesn't belong in like a pantheon, that they're like, no, not, not building up this knowledge about this universe. And so, yeah, I feel like multiverse is quite often like this, this very simple glue that fixes the what if scenarios together and makes them all like, ah, this Spider-Man, that's not just like a standalone scenario uh, idea. That's actually a parallel universe to this other Spider-Man that you already know, and they actually can meet. It's like, I, 
just just write a nice story about alternative universe Spider-Man. It's okay. Anyway, uh, the reason why I don't like this is that um, the implications of the multiverse are far more reaching than those stories use the multiverse for. They use them, the superhero stories use the multiverse to kind of like justify alternative versions of characters, why they exist and how they coexist. But actually what the multiverse, if this exists and if it's possible to travel between multiverses, that's actually a pretty, it's kind of a horror scenario to, if you think about it. It's a kind of cosmic horror and then sense that it questions our conceptions of identity and, and, and you know, it's kind of like makes, dissolves the stories that you want to try to tell in kind of like an ocean of meaninglessness, right? It's like, like again, this idea of cosmic horror that the individual doesn't mean anything because there's so much ground there things outside of you. And um, Solidity was a short story that kind of like leaned into that horror, that cosmic horror scenario. I'm not going to go into the details because I already spent too much on this, but yeah. This last uh, short story, Solidity, kind of focuses on the cosmic horror aspect of it, uh, of the multiverse, and even manages to somehow come up hopeful at the end. So that's that was really, really nice. Yeah, if you like hard sci-fi, uh, really, really hard sci-fi, then I would recommend Greg Egan and I recommend this, sh this short story collection. Now, this is not something I've read this month. I actually read it last month, but I also read the Wool Trilogy, which is now being turned into a TV series called uh, Silo on Apple TV. Uh, Apple Plus. Apple TV Plus? I don't know. Um, I started watching the TV series. Uh, I liked the premise and I was like eager to see where it goes and I didn't want to wait until new episodes co come out. So I just picked up the book and started reading. The book is crazy page turny. It's like I just swallowed the three books <laughs> in like two weeks or so. I don't know. It was just crazy pace. Um, very well paced, fast pacing, um, solid world building, interesting solid world building. Um, also the guy who wrote it, Hugh Holy, has a has a knack of describing things. Like he goes into some really cool descriptions of, of things that work really well. Um, I will say that somewhere in the second book, uh, the it loses the thread and it just completely dissolves into just like really not good ending. Like I don't feel the author uh, like because it's you can tell that it started as a, as a short story um, and then it spun out into like this whole big universe and it's not really m meant to go anywhere. And it does have an ending, but the ending feels kind of like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's not, it, was, it didn't leave me satisfied. It didn't build up to anything more interesting than you had at the beginning. Um, but I have to say, like, um, it's kind of like weird to contrast Apple, the Apple TV version, the uh, TV version with the book, because the book is incredibly well paced, like fast paced and, you know, get, go from one situation to the next. And it's like, oh, how is going to the hero get out of this one? And uh, Apple TV, I, I have the problem with all of the Apple TV shows, which where it's like, they're just incredibly slow paced, like really sluggish pace and, and just re repeating the same plot points over and over again. Like it feels like they're padding out the time. And uh, yeah, so like if you watch the first season, that's like half of the first book. Uh, so uh, yeah, the book is in this regard, the book is a lot better than the TV series. I did like the first episodes of the TV series, but the second half of the first season kind of like... I also, um, um, I haven't read this one yet. I'm currently reading it, A Half-Built Garden. I started reading it a while ago and I, now I just finally returned to it. Uh, it is a bit of a challenging sci-fi story. Again, sci-fi. I do like reading sci-fi. Um, it's a bit of a challenging book. It's um, It has been pitched to me as kind of like a very unusual sci-fi, and it is very unusual sci-fi. The setting is kind of like unique. Uh, very interesting ideas. Um, it's a, like a alien first contact story, but in the future that is kind of like post environmental collapse but not negative like in a kind of like a solar punk way kind of like people trying to uh, repair 
um, the destroyed Earth. Um, and it's um, it is an interesting it's an interesting um, first contact story because the aliens that it depicts they're not crazy, outrageous, you know, mind blowing kind of aliens, but they have subtle cultural aspects that you don't see usually in in alien stories. A challenge kind of like. Uh, or like they dig into hot topics. Um, so for example, I'm going to spoil one, one aspect, which kind of like comes up pretty much in the first chapter, um, which is the aliens. Um, so in our culture right now, uh, having children uh, and taking care of children is kind of like a secondary thing. You know, usually it's, it's kind of like this cliche of, you know, the, the women stay at home, take care of the children, while the men, you know, are the breadwinners, the... the, the uh, do the important stuff, right? Uh, and the aliens kind of like reverse this. Uh, so in an alien culture, bearing children, taking care of children is a sign of leadership. So if you're in a leadership position, you have to have your children with you. And uh, when you're doing diplomacy with other people, you have to bring your children with you um, to show that you are approaching, you know, the other, other side with with trust and good intention because you're my kids you know and yeah that's i like that that's an interesting idea um and they discuss this in a very detailed way and and it 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 does some some good stuff um and it's fun to imagine kind of like this kind of society and how they would interact with with humans um something i don't quite like is that is very slow paced and the slow pace is due to the fact that there's a lot of characters that are not very well introduced. It's kind of like this, you know, uh, like a lot of science fiction stories are kind of like these stories where you kind of like pick it up as you go. Like you, they bombard you with with ideas and concepts and don't explain them. And you're supposed to figure it out as you go. And at the beginning, you're confused, but later on, you figure it out. And it's the, the, the setting is so unusual that it kind of is difficult to follow along. And there's, again, lots of people who are not really well introduced and... Um, uh, to make things more complicated, like the families of the people in the society are very non-conventional. So there's like different gen genders and transgender people. And it's just like really confusing to understand who is who and what their role is in this family, because it's just like not really clear. I wish it was more upfront and more clear about um, these kind of like unusual family situations. It's a it's a long book and and it has some good premises so far, but it kind of like got slowed down in the middle there. And I'm hoping to get over the hump and get into the plot again. But yeah, still not finished on this one. I'm gonna circle back on this when I'm when I'm done. Okay, I want to discuss this. So this is a notion I've heard from other sources as well. I see this kind of like post on social media popping up every now and again. Uh, so this is a guy called B Sticks, uh, and he says. Uh, I miss written tutorials. I hate how every tutorial is a YouTube now. I don't want to watch 50 minutes and forget to pay attention for a second that has detail that I'm missing or is it just uh, or it just doesn't show. Even short tutorials are three minutes when it could have been a 10 second read. I want to skim a page and go directly to the point. Has writing really become that hard to do? Um, I've seen this, and obviously I'm doing YouTube tutorials, so I feel kind of like attacked. <laughs> and I felt, um, I, I have some thoughts about this. Um, and you know, you see that post and then people are in the, com in the comments like, oh yeah, totally, yeah, bring back the text tutorials. I totally want to just read. I just don't want to watch videos. Oh, that's so, all the YouTubers suck. And so I'm additionally challenged and, <laughs> and attacked. Um, Broadly speaking, yes, true, it's true. There is just like a lot more videos now and a lot, of, a lot of our knowledge that we're building on the internet right now is in form of videos and that's not good. Yes, it would be good if it was more text-based, I think. Uh, a lot of the stuff that is as, as video right now could be uh, captured somewhere as te in text form, for sure. I, broadly speaking, agree. But, <laughs> um, First of all, I want to maybe I would maybe question whether the text stuff is really gone. Like um, the way he this person wants to use a uh, tutorial is they want to look up something very specific. They want to answer some, some question they or they their specific question they have, right? And I think for this text kind of already exists, right? Like the, this person, like what they're looking for. There is 
Stack Overflows, there is wikis, you know, these are excellent locations to look up specific information, right? Um, so I'm not sure exactly, like it kind of depends on what kind of situation he's talking about, but it seems like the, the kind of text that he's looking for still exists. It's just like not a tutorial. It's just like a wiki or Stack Overflow or some kind of other um, knowledge database. So I'm not exactly sure if uh, if I would agree that all of the text has disappeared, but it's packaged differently now for sure. That was previously we would have blogs with tutorials and so forth. Or um, something that I do miss is um, you used to have game facts and people would just write game facts like in text file that would just do like a description of what you do in a game. And um, yeah, these have been basically replaced by Let's Plays. And uh, sometimes if you want to look up something, then there's going to be like, a, I don't know, IGN will do like a very complicated, very uh, uh, overburdened with advertisements, uh, wiki kind of situation where you can look up stuff, but uh, it's not, not a pleasant experience. I wish we had still that game facts culture with the text file based tutorials. That was really nice. Um, but yeah, um, one reason that is very obvious why that uh, is the case, why we no longer have as much you know, of a blog culture, of a, of a tutorial culture, is that it's very hard to build an audience with text alone, right? And with audience, I mean, you could say like it's difficult to monetize text. That's for sure the case. Uh, but it's not just like monetization. It's just also like if you if I write something on a blog, you know, will that lead to people subscribing to my blog and tuning up, um, in next time when I write something else? You know, this, this, these things used to be true in the past. This is no longer the case. Uh, or at least it feels like it's no longer the case. But if I make a video and put it on a YouTube channel, then people might subscribe and then might tune in next time when I make another video. So um, a lot of people who create stuff and want to, you know, want to build an audience like I do, um, will naturally gravitate to YouTube because that's just like, or videos, because that's just like the way you build an audience. You create a conversation with your audience today. And, it, you know, it's it's difficult to, to point pinpoint why that shift happened. I mean, one of the big problems is obviously the big lie that everything was built on, you know, the lie by Facebook when it was suddenly everything was pivoted to video. But also the fact that YouTube is owned by Google and Google kind of controls uh, where people go right now. So if you look for something, you're more likely to be um, uh, directed towards a YouTube video and you don't really have that kind of like similar infrastructure uh, with um, with text-based kind of stuff. There is obviously different blogging platforms, but it's, they're just not quite as active. Uh, they're not quite as, um, they don't hold as much audience seemingly as YouTube does. But I think there's also a little bit more there's, there's even, there's, we have, we're picking the stuff apart here, right? Because then later on the same, I, I, I think it's a different person, but they write also. Uh, it's probably more to do with discoverability and monetization. So kind of like my point, right? Like it's difficult to discover text. It's difficult to monetize or build an audience with text. Um, I'm generalizing a ton, but I feel like there, is, there isn't even a ton of super useful YouTube tutorials outside of beginner content because that gets, gets the most views. So this, this gets us very quickly into this problem where it's like the problem is that those people don't find content that is specifically targeted at them. Like, why is not this stuff specifically catered to me? <laughs> I want to be catered to, you know? <laughs> Uh, which is kind of like very self-centered perspective. Um, obviously, uh, there's always going to be more content, beginner content out there than non-beginner content. It's always going to be easier to find um, beginner content than more advanced kind of content, simply because there's just always going to be more beginners. And also because beginners are usually the people who need the help. If you're already advanced, if you're already in a topic, then you may be already plugged into community, then you maybe already have, you know, or you have already some, have some skills, then maybe you already have the tools to overcome some challenges. But as a beginner, you might not have like any kind of help, any kind of context. That's why there's usually uh, content for beginners and not for advanced kind of people. And also, you know, it's kind of like this problem, like when you, um, 
when you create something that is kind of like for, for a very, very small audience, then again, how are you going to build an audience this this way? This way? And by the way, I just like because all the people say like, yeah, you know, <laughs> even short tutorials are three minutes, uh, and it could have been a ten second read. I, I'm going to put a doubt on this. I I made a blog in the past. People are not reading, generally not reading your stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. People just don't have the attention. You write a huge, beautiful text and people will just skim through it, will skip parts. You can tell because they then ask questions at the bottom and you answer the questions in your text and you have to like quote them this, the text like, yeah, I write it here, you know. Uh, and reading a long text can t takes a lot more than 10 seconds. Just finding the thing that you want. It's, mm, I think people under, uh, widely underestimate how long it takes to read text. You know, there's like what we think we do, but what we actually do, you know, it's like we think we want to read all the stuff. But in fact, if you give the people a lot of text, they won't read it. But in the end, uh, kind of like broadly speaking, I agree. Um, but I would not go as one-sided as this person does here. Um, I think there is advantages to text and there's advantages to video. Uh, both have advantages and disadvantages. Video is really easy just to fall into. Like you just click play and just watch and you just see things happening. It's your text requires a lot more engagement, a lot more drive from you, which can be good if you're looking for a very specific information. Video is really bad at that, really bad at delivering a very specific piece of information. Uh, skimming through a video is very bad. You kind of have to, you know, commit to the experience. You have to um, let it play out. Um, text can be read more selectively, broadly speaking. But also video is really good at providing a context, like b providing a broad understanding of a subject rather than specific factoids. So um, that's why I like doing tutorials. And that's why I think tutorials are good for beginners, video tutorials, is because there's just, as a beginner, you don't have a question. You just, broadly speaking, don't know what to do. And then seeing somebody go through all of the paces and um, giving answers to questions that you weren't even aware of uh, and providing you the kind of context that you are missing to even understand, uh, start thinking about a subject. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for en encyclopedic kind of knowledge where it's like in the specific fact that yes, video is bad for that. But again, I feel like we already kind of have that. Maybe not to the extent that we should have. Uh, something I would maybe do with this kind of question is like to twist around. So that's like, what's the kind of system, what's the kind of environment, the kind of community that w you would wish would exist that would cater to this need, you know, that would create these kind of like t text tutorials. And then if we have a broad understanding, if there's enough people who want to have these kind of text tutorials, maybe we can somehow create it. You know, kind of like the old social media are breaking apart at this point. We're kind of like in a, in a phase of change. We are building stuff up again from scratch. We're creating Mastodon and, and other stuff. So maybe there's a good opportunity to, uh, to, you know, take lessons from the previous phase of the internet and maybe create a new type of internet built upon the experiences from the previous phase, kind of like fixing the problems that happened in the social media phase of the internet. Just some thoughts about, about uh, why people like to say that they hate video tutorials. Right, as I said, I didn't play a lot of games. You know, I had like the, the two week two week uh, rush in the beginning and then later on uh, on vacation I didn't play too much video games. I brought Switch with me. I was hoping to play a lot of Diablo 2. I was kind of like I had this idea that I will play Diablo 2 in a tent. Uh, Diablo is a very dark game. <laughs> if it's sunny outside it's difficult to play Diablo. <laughs> um, and also like all the online connectivity makes like a very miserable experience. Um, but I did play a little bit of Final Fantasy Adventure. If you don't know about this, I'm doing speed runs of Final Fantasy Adventure, which is a game from my childhood. I've created a separate YouTube channel for this, Chris, Crispin Speedruns. It has eight subscribers. Yay! <laughs> uh, and I've been practicing the speedrun of it, a very specific type of speedrun. Um, I've done 10 attempts, 10 full attempts of speedrunning this game, not too many yet. I'm just like getting into a hang of it. But this month I've achieved a big breakthrough in my time. I've achieved a personal best of 47 
minutes and 24 seconds. That's amazing. Uh, that's like like 10 minutes, like cut off, um, shaved off 10 minutes of my previous time, which is which is a big deal. It's a big break- breakthrough. Still not, <laughs> not even close to the to what is happening at the very top of the of the leaderboard. But I was happy that um, about this result, and I submitted. This is the actual run that I recorded there, and I submitted the run actually to the um, to the speedrun uh, forums, to speedrun.com, and you can tell that I am here. There we go, there I am, on place 11, place 11, 47.24, that was my run here. So that was my first submission to the speedrun comes and throwing my hat into the ring. I knew I would be at place 11, but but still throwing my hat into the ring. So yeah, now the next step is continue doing this, continue uh, working on this. And, and, you know, my next opponent is Duftatup here, This, this is not a German player who has 45, so I have to shave off uh, a little bit over a minute from my from my time to defeat him. And then I will be on place number 10. Um, broadly speaking, I want to continue this route that I'm practicing until I get a sub 40 time, which I think is still possible with this route. And then once I'm at sub 40, <clears throat> I will uh, transition to the new route. There's a new route that was just recently discovered that people are playing by Dagmore. Uh, and that route is uh, sub 30 uh, is possible, but that it requires a lot more new tricks that I need to learn and new sequence of events. And, and it's also it's kind of like still in flux. People are still trying to figure out what the best way possible is. And I'm not eager to participate in that. I'm gonna let other people figure it out. And I'm gonna see. Yeah, all right, so Duftatube, you're next. You're next. I'm gonna get you, Duftatube. I'm gonna get you. All right. Yes. Yeah, so that was that was all of the things that I want to discuss. <clears throat> Plans for next month. What are the things that are happening next month? Well, I'm still going to be obviously working on a short tutorial. We are kind of like getting to the point where my prep work runs out, where I'm kind of like approaching completely new territory. We need, still need to finish the brains. We can start a brain system that kind of works. I mean, to expand the brain system to, to have more commands, to make more interesting behaviors and maybe create some interesting behaviors from the enemies. Uh, then bullet system, uh, creating bullet patterns. That's going to be a different challenge. And then also we need to circle back to the schedule editor and kind of like bring in the brains and the bullets into the schedule editor. That will complete our uh, tool suite and then we can start designing the actual level. Hmm. And actually for the designing of the level, I was actually planning, I may, may, might be doing this this month, I was wanted to actually reach out to some of the shmup devs that I uh, know and do some interviews and ask them about their process, about the specific process of how they created the levels. Because I think this is kind of something that a lot of people are struggling. I received some questions about that. You know, how do you design a level, a shmup level? How do you decide, you know, what enemy patterns are coming? What is a good enemy pattern, you know? What is good enemy behavior like um and then not just like figuring out like the solution what is the good solution give me the solution but like the process of how you do you arrive at a scrub level where do you start do you sketch out everything on paper do you just click and then and play and see what works like what is the process there what is maybe some rules of thumb that you uh, developed throughout the process i'm eager to f- ask other shrimp developers that and maybe we can um, yeah, maybe you can schedule some interviews. I'm not sure if this will work out, but I'm going to try. Yeah, there's still also the GBA HD stuff that I want to do. I'm going to finish that that one. I'm, I I can feel it. I think it can work. I, fingers crossed. And also another thing that's also coming up. Me and my wife, we are going to buy a coffee machine, an espresso, espresso machine. Actually, last month we've been I haven't discussed it, so we've been actually shopping a little bit, not shopping, but like like window shopping, and and uh, asked people around and and they did some research and we kind of committed to a machine. It will arrive soon, but that's something that you will see on the next episode of the Lazy Devlog. Yeah, that's right, the next episode. So um, yeah, this is one of the one of the kind kind of thing. Maybe I'm going to do something something like this yearly or something. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, if you are subscribed to me on coffee.com or if you just did a one-time donation on coffee.com, then you get those lazy devlogs every month. 
So you can see what's happening with me. You get a glimpse behind the scenes. And also, um, you also get access to backlog of the lazy dev log, so you can follow me. <laughs> you can go back two years and see how I how I developed the recent recent videos and how I you know how things changed in my life. So yeah, if you want to support me on uh, on coffee.com, then please do so. I would be very very happy about that. But you don't have to. Right. So let's see what August has in store. The future is bright. See you next round, guys. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.